Welcome to Deep Look, Ulti World's weekly radio show about the current state of Ultimate. I'm the host and the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me, Ulti World senior editor, Keith Rayner. Keith, March Madness is all done. And we had some awesome tournaments on both the men's and women's side. And uh, we also got the start of the baseball season. And I just wanted to point this out to you. If baseball, a like 125 year old sport, I know immediately where this is going. <laughs> can reduce the amount of downtime in the game with a clock. Ultimate can do it too, Keith. It is time, folks. We've got to stop having what is it? we went from 90 to 85 seconds between pulls. We need to get to 60 as soon as possible and hopefully 45 soon thereafter. It just doesn't make any sense to have these games stretch. How many games go to cap? Because of the amount of time between points, I, it, it so 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 many. It's crazy. Uh, I cannot. Yeah, now the the actual in practice effects of this. As I just coached, you know, a mid slash low level college tournament this past weekend, sure. and who I who could say how many minutes were spent between points? <laughs> Two three minutes coming in and out of timeouts. <laughs> just. And a, a cornucopia of lost minutes. <laughs> I'm telling you, Keith, it can be done. And I, I, you know, people are going to say, well, no, we won't have time to sit on the line and pick every single matchup and talk and talk and talk. Okay. That's too bad for you. We'll give you some 30 second timeouts that you can use extra timeouts and everything else. Like you don't just get to go wander around on the field for 40 seconds. That's that is that is one of the key components, especially in college. You know, you you get like the first thirty seconds or so is spent cheering, and then everybody comes on the field, right? Every, and, everyone and that eats up comes so on the much field. of the time. <laughs> <laughs> that that part right there, because then you have to clear those people out as you call your your next line, and then only only at that point, when like sixty seconds have already elapsed, are you actually starting to talk about strategy? So obviously, at that point, you know. You set up your offense, your defense, your second look, your matchups, like all that's not happening in 30 seconds. Now, people will adapt. People will adapt to a shorter, shorter clock. Exactly. Uh, now, isn't baseball just taking the stall count? So really, they're they're still behind us, right? Like they're yeah. just, they just adapted the stall count. Fair. But and, and to be fair, it's been an adjustment period in baseball. There have already been people who have gotten, you know, taken a strikeout because they were out of the batter's box or a pitcher who gives up a walk because they were not pitching fast enough. But guess what? They're going to get over it in about two weeks, and then it's not going to be an issue anymore. I just, I believe in us as a community, and please, rules committee, have the stones to do it. Just do it. Please, please, seventy. get us to 70 seconds. Let's just get to 70 seconds, and let's slowly work our way towards it. And I know it, w- it will improve the flow of the game. It will improve. Every, everybody will be happy that it was done in like a year i promise okay alternatively what the rules committee could do is bring it down to like 20 seconds <laughs> and then they play one tournament everybody hates it and then they boost it back they up to 70 seconds it was like oh it's so seconds. good <laughs> it's oh 70 seconds 60 seconds it feels like a like a just a dreamland uh, of perfection so Anyway, yeah, I, sometimes you got to find your new methodology. I, I love the changes to baseball. I don't know if you've watched any baseball games, but it's get, you know, we're having big, long games that are ending in two and a half hours. It's awesome. That pace pace of play is is certainly it certainly helped. And that was, of course, one of the biggest points uh, that they were trying to address. So ultimate can use the same could use the same formula. They're definitely we, we literally have the same right now problem. how long games are. Games just are extended for no reason other than people standing around on the field. That is just a fact. Okay, let's get into the show. Uh, Easterns and the end of the regular season is here. The bid allocation is not finalized. We don't exactly know. We have the Frisbee rankings projections. Uh, Hopefully we will have the USA Ultimate rankings out soon, but even those aren't really final until all the data gets checked. And there's all there. We've had some crazy changes at the very final moments (laughs) at the last. Um, And so that could happen again. So keep an eye on that. Who knows? Maybe somebody will be ruled ineligible 
that, that, that can swoop a bid away from somebody. But we'll get into all the bid stuff in a little bit. But we should begin here today by talking about Easterns and uh, what a tournament it was. UNC absolutely dominating and uh, cruising to an undefeated weekend. They get past uh, the team that beat them back at Smoky Mountain Invite, Massachusetts, 15-12 after opening up with a 4-0 lead in that game in the quarterfinals. And then uh, they beat Cal Poly Slow 15-12 in semis, and they beat Vermont 15-10 in the final. Keith, this UNC team is clearly the number one team going into the postseason. Uh, it's not a surprise to see them end at this point. They win Easterns for the first time in 20 years, basically. I thought it was never, as did many players and coaches on the team. <laughs> but apparently, many, many years ago, back in the early 2000s, they did win Easterns. So, um, I, I mean, this is just the most complete team in, in, in the division right now. Uh, look, I, they, the, the number one argument is is very clear. I, I I think that nobody's really surprised by this by this turn that this team came together when they needed to, and I think you're going to continue to see them sharpen. I don't feel like we've seen the peak for this team yet, and that's scary. Uh, they're the clear title favorites, though, at this point after really a dominant performance at Easterns, which it's only is. Does the name Easterns have anything to do with the proximity to Easter, or is it just Eastern? Like directionally, you know, I actually it, I don't know. I always assume it was crossed, the direction. It's never crossed my mind because it's not actually on Easter weekend. No, it's not. It's, Although it's, it's in the springtime, close to Easter. Yeah, it's near Easter. It's Easter. You know. Uh, anyway, uh, look, I'm not impressed by a UNC team unless you can bagel the number two team in the first half. So <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done. They're still playing catch up over here, but these were impressive results, and yeah, you know. Literally the three elite teams that they beat on on the second day of the tournament, we're all missing people. <laughs> so it's true. I, I get I get if you want to put a little asterisk here, but they were just clearly the best team, and they were mostly uh, unchallenged. Feels like a little overstating the fact, but nobody was really putting a scare into them. I, I will say, I'll say that much. John McDonald was out for UNC. So it's not like they had okay, their whole okay. lineup either. Yeah, I mean, that's an all-American quality player. It sure is. You know, UMass, after the very slow start, was pretty much dead even with UNC. But being dead even when you start down 4 nothing is not good enough. And, uh, you know, UMass, ultimately, coming in number one uh, after the win at, at Smoky Mountain Invite, they lose to Pittsburgh in their final round of pool play in a grinder of a game. And then they, you know, ultimately just weren't very competitive with UNC in that game, never got back into it and uh, also lost to Brown. So they go four and three and yes, they were missing Wyatt Kelman. Probably they're, I mean, it's hard with this team. They're pretty deep and have a lot of good players, but he's probably their best player. And they were also missing Jonas Dang Osborne, who can really open up um, the airspace and the D line. But it still feels like, uh, you know, UMass has, Things to work on. They've they've got to figure out how to uh, stick to what they are trying to do, especially against zone defense. And you know, it took them way too long to adjust in that UNC game early on. They kind of got the they just got run out of the gym a little bit. They were getting beat in the deep space. They did not come ready to play. And I, I think it was a little bit of a hangover from the U, from the Pittsburgh game the night before. But uh, you know, I think it's probably good that this team took some losses and can think about how they need to improve before we get to May. Absolutely. That, that is one of the things I, I had thought about when I saw that, you know, they finally, finally got hit a little bit is you, I've, I've, if you've been listening to this show for years, you know that I'm going to say, I, I, I think teams need to take, take a shot before they get into the big games and new England, new England regionals is not going to be an easy run. Uh, but they'll potentially get some chance to take some shots there. But you just don't want to end up in quarters or semis and feel like, okay, this is the first time that somebody's really all over us, that we are playing from behind or being outplayed. Uh, you know, the, Vermont gave them a gave them a good test the last time that they faced off. So, you know, maybe maybe that sufficed. But you want to see how your team responds to adversity and comes back from difficult situations. 
And you'd like to do that and get the reps practicing that when it doesn't actually impact your ability to win a national championship. So, it, I mean, heck, this is a program that's had trouble getting to nationals even when they're good. So I don't think they're going to be taking it for granted at regionals, but it's it's good to get in these these kinds of reps for them. There is still work to be done. I do wonder about their ability to, for a team that's that's really, I feel like, built upon system play and strong fundamentals, I do wonder if that's going to be a challenge given that they have a new coaching staff. Like, is Not that either side will be incapable, but will they be connected? Will they be on the same page Will the team be able to deliver the vision of the of the coaches in crunch time? I think that can be really challenging when you're not steeped in it. You know, when you when you spent four or five years with a coach, it's kind of second nature to you. But uh, when you when when it's a little less established, that connection can can go haywire. So uh, that'll be something to watch for UMass because I don't know if they can necessarily win against elite competition without playing within themselves. If they get away from the system, I, I don't know if they have the talent to just kind of overwhelm you necessarily the way someone like a like a Pittsburgh or a Brown that has these like elite star players can just kind of like, OK, the system the system's gone wrong. What do we do? Uh, I, th- I think you know, maybe Joe, Joe State and Osborne could just boost it enough for them to be OK, but I don't know about that. I, I, I think you see that in the Pittsburgh game. Henry Ng went, you know, crazy in the second half and kind of carried them to a win there. And, and UMass had many, many, many chances to win that game. I thought on the balance, they were probably the better team. But Pittsburgh hung around. They hung around. And despite the fact that Pittsburgh turned it over like three or four times on Universe Point, UMass like kind of looked like a little deer in the headlights he laid in that game. Maybe a little people getting a little concerned about not wanting to make a turnover, not want to be the one to make a big mistake because they have this undefeated run on the line. Um, but they just looked a little they were just swinging back and forth forever against the zone and they were not making any sort of incisive upfield throws and uh, you know eric taylor in uh, in the commentary talked about well they should be running a chisel they need to have somebody coming from behind the disc catching and getting some yardage because otherwise all they were doing is going back and forth until eventually they turned it over and uh i think there's definitely some work to be done in the zone out have, have they, did they? What did they score? Four upwind goals in that in that game. They three. They scored three in the first half. I'm pretty sure. Uh, maybe maybe they added another in the fourth. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But if you're scoring four upwind goals in those conditions, like that should be enough to win. You should definitely win the game. I so totally that, agree. That was disappointing to see. But I mean, film. still, you know, not, all all of the pieces are there for them to be good. I, I, I I'm not really concerned about this team, given the how many bids the region's going to get and the kind of talent we've seen on display this year. You know, you're not, you're not concerned at all. I mean, the history doesn't make you a little I say concerned. What do I mean? What do I mean? I mean that I, I think there's almost no chance they don't make nationals. They might not win the region, but I think they're definitely going to make nationals. Um, what, what a story it would be. <laughs> oh man. That's, that's, that's cruel to even bring up. <laughs> uh but i'm just doing my know, job Charlie. do i think they can win the title uh, i i gotta I, I have to squint a little bit but at the end of the day they still beat unc this season and being able to have actually done that is a big deal not only for their confidence but also for proving that they like have the pieces to do it and i mean i liked a lot of what i saw kayla mcsweeney was excellent i thought well christian was very good uh tobias paperno on the d-line looked great Noel Sierra was like a really solid cutter. Nima Lama was good. Like I think I you could talk about 10 players on this team that played well on the whole of the weekend. So pretty interesting. I think we got to see what they look like at regionals. You know, if they come out and they win solidly at, at, at New England regionals and look great, I'm going to feel pretty good. And they say and, and be able to say, well, you know, they were missing two key players and it hurt them. I I, I agree. I mean, I'm not worried about them after this tournament, but you can see some of the areas of that need to be shored up or could be weaknesses when it comes down to the hair splitting. It feels like we're going to be doing in the bracket at nationals. Uh, Keith, I just want to go back to UNC for one second before we move on. Obviously a very comfortable win for them this weekend. And, you know, all their U24 guys looked great. I thought Ben Dameron was fantastic. Dylan Hawkins, who's not a U24 guy, looked fantastic. 
Uh, Eli Freed is a defensive player of the year nominee. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. I mean, Josh Singleton as a sophomore looked fantastic out there. It's how many people have you said so far? Five. I know. I, I know. I know. You haven't even gotten to the two players I would talk about first. Kevin so like, Pannoni, that's, that tells you Matt McKnight. Well, yeah. Where, where are you yes. going? <laughs> uh, Ronald Smith. I mean, you're, you're, Smith. this is Ronald Smith. <laughs> they are Ke- Kevin Pannoni and Matt, Matt McKnight were like the next three on the list to me. So like, yeah, I mean, this is a great team. I don't, they, you know, is Ben Dameron quite at the LSB Matt Gushohannes level? No, I, I don't. I don't think I'd go that far. So, like, if you're going to point to something about this team that might be different than the past, is they don't have that superstar. But man, they got like eight stars behind that guy. <laughs> is is it going to be a team with a star player? That's good enough overall as a team to beat this UNC team in nationals. That's really what it's going to come down to. That's the only way this UNC team loses. I think I don't see them losing to a team like UMass at nationals because UMass doesn't have that guy either. That's another really deep team that, you know, maybe is very close to the level of UNC. But I'm thinking that it's going to be a Henry Ng type Pittsburgh led team. Uh, a maybe Calvin Brown goes crazy for slow. He was he had a really nice couple games this weekend. There's one team I think outside of Pittsburgh that fits that bill. Tell and me. I don't know that it is slow. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe a full power slow, but I, I don't know if they have that that one guy. But it's Colorado is the other team. Sure. Uh, but who's their you know, guy? They. they I mean, Danny Landisman and Calvin Stone sure. combined are sure. are easily that guy. Th- but, that may be a better uh, top two than than UNC. Arguably, yeah, I, I think I think I would say that it is, but I, I, and I do think that they have depth behind that. It's just that they that depth is going to have to perform, and uh, I, I still wouldn't like favor them against UNC or whatever. But if you're looking for a team that fits the description, I feel like Colorado is probably the number one suspect. It's followed by followed by Pittsburgh. This, this team didn't win the championship, but it's like Jack Williams, UNC Wilmington. Just he went crazy, and they beat UNC, and. They didn't have enough. They weren't a good enough team to win the championship. But I think, you know, Colorado clearly. No, I don't know that any player is as good as Jack Williams was. Uh, maybe Henry Ng. Right. Just in terms of like raw talent, ability to take over a game. Yeah. But the teams we just named are all much better top to bottom than that Wilmington team was. I agree with that, although I look forward to the potential commentary about how we're wrong on that front <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's let's move on um keith you asked this question i think it's a good one and i'll ask it to you how real was vermont's run they make it to the final and uh they do drop a game to cal poly slow but then they get through brown and pittsburgh in the bracket close games uh before they kind of get whomped by unc in a one-sided affair you think it's legit is this team you know the second best third slash third best team at the tournament it, it is a little concerning to see the score they put up against slow. You know, they, they lose that game 12, eight and it is worth noting while we're, we're we'll keep mentioning, I guess the various absences, no Declan Kervik for, uh, for Vermont this weekend Brown playing at the highest level. I think we've seen from them yet. So that's a legit win in quarters. Like that's a quarters quality win. And then you get Pittsburgh who I think also was playing the best that we've seen them all season. You know, I, I still would you know, want to get, a matchup against like a UMass at that point, but uh, that wasn't a chance that they got. But I, I do think at this tournament, right, based on the way teams are playing, Pittsburgh is probably one of the four best teams. So, you know, I, I still think it's they they get they get kind of beat up in the final. Uh, they they got as close what is within three goals or something in the second half. So not not really a a contest in that one. I. I'm curious if this team has what it takes to get across the finish line, but I do think this is a solid showing for them. I think they should be proud of, of what they did at the field. And you know, they, they are certainly in that like top five semifinals conversation. I, th- I just think that's clear from, from the weekend, even if I, I don't know, they necessarily had like uh, a path that's going to replicate what they have to do at nationals, but a strong showing on, on their part. And I, I, at first, at first blush, I was a little skeptical but the more I look at it, the more I think that they saw most of the best teams of the tournament. I will say this. I, I think Vermont was fortunate to catch Pittsburgh when they did. Pittsburgh was totally exhausted by the end of that game. I mean, just 
that you know the final point henry ing is like barely able to try to chase down a the game winning huck and i i think that's in part because for pittsburgh to get breaks they have to have henry ing and tristan yarder on the field and when we saw them in key points at any point in the game both of those guys were on the field and they just they have to kind of run their top guys a lot and it just is what it is that they are not as deep as some of the other teams at the tournament um that said i think you're right that they were impressive this weekend i think they clearly have taken a step forward i think they have a little bit more to go i think that they can play better than they than they did this weekend and that was a pretty darn good weekend where they only took that one loss to vermont they beat umass they crushed te- other teams um, and they got nice wins over Minnesota, 15-11, and a one-point win over Slow and Consolation. I, I like what I see overall, but I do think that they, you know, the question is how much, do, will they have the stamina necessary to go all the way to a championship? That, I, I, I don't know. I, I think they have to get the right set of teams and maybe playing fewer games per day at Nationals is to their benefit. Which which of of these three teams? These are the three pool winners aside from UNC. Which of these three teams impressed you the most? Like uh, raised what you think of them, raise your estimation of them. Pittsburgh, Slow, and Brown. Which one of those teams do you feel like changed how you feel about them the most at Easterns? Slow, because I already believed that Brown and Pittsburgh were going to be solid and take a step forward, and I think that's exactly what we saw. Slow, on the other hand, I thought was a step below this, but they they clearly, to me, actually belong in the top level conversation as a potential semifinalist candidate. Um, you know, part of that is probably colored by the when I saw them. I watched them dismantle Vermont, dismantle Vermont. Vermont said it was the worst game they played all season, and it's kind of hard to argue with that. Their <laughs> energy was super flat. They they had no pop or pace in their game. Slow sideline was just dominating their own, and they just never even had a foothold in the game. Slow proceeded to lose to Wisconsin in the next round. Although, to be fair, they'd already won the pool, but it's still <laughs> classic college ultimate. Um, you know, I didn't see them play UNC. I didn't see them play Pittsburgh in their, in their two late losses on the weekend, but I really liked overall what I saw from them. Um, whether you want to talk, I mean, obviously Calvin Brown, the biggest name on this team. I thought against Vermont, he was excellent. He didn't try to do too much. He was hitting really sharp break throws and helping them move the disc in the upwind direction and get those key breaks. Um, but, you know, Max Gade was very good. Leo Loritzen was very good. Uh, I, I think they're a pretty balanced team with a lot of good systems. And we saw that on display. Uh, I think they need to get healthy. You know, no Seamus Robinson this weekend, and he's key for them. I, I only laugh because it's like I know we say it every year about. The, I, <laughs> I I make the same joke. All like, what are what are they going to hire a better me- medical staff over there? Like, what <laughs> is what's in the water? It's slow. They always are banged up. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you add Seamus Robinson and Garrett Bush to this team, you got Alex Nelson having a breakout year. You got Max Gage starting to show some of the promise that. He brought to the team as a freshman. You got Calvin Brown finding his rhythm, like semifinals quality team. I mean, we are back where I think that we felt like we were to start the year, which is that there are way more teams that feel like they could meet meet in semifinals than there are semifinal spots available, which should make maybe for the first time quarterfinals feel like really dramatic. I I, I do want to come back because I, I got off on the tangent of Pittsburgh when we were talking about Vermont. I just want to note, I think they have a lot of talent on this team. I think that we saw really strong performances from Zachary Watson Stevens. I love what Chris Keepert was able to bring to the D-line, and then he crossed over onto O uh, after an injury in the final. Um, And uh, of course, you know, you got Johnny Sickles and Turner Allen, who are great. Uh, Ben Payson is a nice defensive handler for them. Uh, Chase Drinkwater. And... uh, their uh, superstar goal scorer, Carl Crawford. I mean, he couldn't be stopped in the deep space. Uh, <laughs> I they, they had a lot of the good pieces. I think one thing, they tended to stare down the barrel a little bit on offense and just like wait for cutters. Um, and at times against the best teams, 
the lack of sort of quicker motion and faster resets seem to cost them some possessions. So I don't know if that's something that they can really structurally change, but it is something that I think is a little bit of a concern. And it's why really good defensive teams like Cal Poly, like UNC, I think really were able to to do damage against them. They're they're impressive. Uh, I can't unsee my my Wilmington comp for them, but that we we know what that type of team can do, and I do agree that they're they're deep. I mean, they can go into the into the rotation confidently, and that's a big difference maker for for Vermont right now. Is there you know we've, we've talked about a lot of the top line teams. Uh, there's a whole middle core, you know, where you have your Cal's and your Minnesotas and your Carltons. And then you got teams at the back end that may be disappointed. Your Michigans, your Georgias, your South Carolinas. Uh, where, what jumped out at you from from the field at, at Easterns? Oh, it's a murky middle, isn't it? I mean, it is. I think I still can't understand why Georgia is playing as badly as they are. <laughs> I mean, I I watched their opener against Tufts. They lost. It was a pretty good game. I thought Georgia played pretty well, and then they proceeded to lose the rest of their games on the day, including getting blown out by Vermont 13-7. Now, they bounced back on Sunday in the, you know, the, basically the loser's bracket, and they won three games, but hard to get excited about wins over Auburn, Ohio State, and Michigan. I just feel like there's, there is a really good team somewhere in here, and I don't know why they haven't been able to find out what it is. I mean, legit Aiden Downey is one of the probably a top five player in the country right now. I mean, th- there is no reason this Georgia team can't be better. So that's definitely something that was pretty surprising to me to see them struggle the way that they did. Um, what else? I mean, how about we'll talk about it more in the next segment, but Cal coming here, running that zone and going all the way to a ninth place bracket win, including beating NC State 12 11 in a game which had they lost probably would have cost them the bid <laughs> that they earned by going to Easterns and winning all the games that they did. I mean, it's, you, you got to tip the cap. It's incredible. Four bid Southwest. You got to be kidding. I've never, this doesn't compute. Something isn't right. Something's not going to, something's going to break. USA is going to steal a bid away for some reason. BYU is going to decide at the last minute to go to conferences. I don't know. They should, they, when they get to regionals, they should be selling pennies that like say like Southwest strong and then have a picture of a calzone on the front and just like <laughs> lean into this whole calzone thing. I mean, I'm a strong bully guy, but I can appreciate a good calzone. Uh, they, they look, this is, we all knew that the setup was great for them and they delivered. I mean, they even hung, hung tough with Pittsburgh, you know, uh, they're a good team. They've been inconsistent, but so pretty much everybody around that line is, uh, except for like Northeastern, who's like the same all the time. But uh, when you talk about those Northwest teams that they're competing with for those last couple of bid slots, like Georgia, NC State, like nobody here has out and out been a great team that you feel like you're, you're, you're really confident in. Yeah, so they went out and earned it. Exciting to see. I, I, I have no issues with it. I have no qualms with it. It doesn't feel unfair i know the ac is probably big sad but gotta do the work yeah we'll, we'll we'll get to that um the other thing is i kind of feel like i don't see it with oregon i'm not sure i see it i don't you know they they were they, they had four and three weekend they played close with everybody basically I, I just this is not a championship team and i don't really put them in that tier in fact i'd be surprised if they made semis they they felt ahead of schedule to me to be as good as they were during the year, and maybe they've come back down to earth a little bit. This is a team that they just feel a little immature, and that's okay. They kind of get in their own way sometimes, but they're still not a team I want to see in pre quarters. You know, they're no. They, there's a lot if they of end talent. up as like a three or a four seed in a pool. Like they're definitely a landmine, but they also are have that that. They're volatile. They're volatile. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I, I have a hard time getting much of a read on some of these teams. You know, Carlton kind of mixed results. They go three and one and don't get to play in the bracket. 
That's uh, a tough break for them. They do beat Wisconsin 15-12, running mostly open lines. But, you know, <laughs> you know they're all thinking in the back of their head, oh, God, we don't want to play Wisconsin in a game to go at regionals. <laughs> Uh, and, and listen, Wisconsin's had some real moments this year. I don't, I don't think they look like pushovers at all. Uh, disappointing South Carolina performance. You know, they get the win, so at least they can feel like they belong. But, you know, obviously they, they would have loved to walk away with the bid. But, but Charlie, look, I'm not here to berate anybody. But there's one <laughs> team that just got dogged this weekend. And they didn't even, it wasn't even the Eastern qualifiers winner. Like, I, I've, I'm no historian about Easterns, but like, has any team ever got out there and been less qualified to be at this tournament than Auburn? <laughs> I mean, just dogged out there. Uh, they were putting up fours, fives, threes. Tough weekend for Ados and the Southeast as a whole. Uh, yeah, the region, the I mean, region not in, not in great shape right now. They, <laughs> they, they went into the bottom bracket with all the other teams that like went 0-4 <laughs> oh, no. in pool play, and they lost 15-3, 15-4, and 15-3. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough. I don't really know how they got in. Um, good on them for like bamboozling the TD. Uh, I mean, their score lines like- were a little closer in the really, really windy conditions on Saturday, and which you know, we ha- it's funny we haven't even mentioned that yet, but I think it goes to show you the quality of play in the college division has come a long way because it was really windy. And yeah, there were a lot of turnovers, but it was like competitive, fun games to watch. And that would not have been true five years ago, I feel like. No, no, I, this would have been a, an absolute disaster. And it was really windy. We're talking like 20 to 25 pretty sustained wins. So yeah, not, yeah. not good, not good. I think it, it, a great tournament as always. We get a great chance to look at the best teams and, you know, UNC finally snapping a, a, a really long drought at Easterns. Can they avoid the Easterns curse and that Eric Taylor described on the air and uh, perform to their best capabilities at Nationals? We shall see. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're talking bids and, uh, of course, more Easterns uh, and how it affected the bid picture. Stay with us. Spring college season is here and the warm weather is on its way. That means it's reversible season. Breakmark is giving away free reversibles for teams that order a bundle. With prices starting at just $75, it's the best way to have your team looking game ready this spring. And reorders get a 20% discount. Get started today at breakmark.com. Welcome back to Deep Look. Time to talk about the bids. And of course, again, this is not finalized. Uh, these are projections from Cody Mills's frisbeerankings.com. And we thank him for his service as we get to take a look at what the likely final bid allocation will be. Keith, Eastern's uh, really delivered. And something like seven of the eight teams in the ninth place bracket were within striking distance for either gaining or losing a bid. It was awesome. And ultimately, Cal, with their win, one point win over NC State, sneaks past NC State into the uh, what is likely to be the final bid spot, assuming that BYU does not play at conferences, which is uh, what we have heard as the, their plan. So that will mean that the Southwest, Keith, is going to get four bids. And on the other side, the AC all the way down to one. Losing two bids in one weekend is is brutal. Absolutely gut punch. Especially when uh, you know, the the other team in your region just won the tournament. So well, and you know, and here's the thing that makes it even just more painful. You have Atlantic Coast teams at number 20 in the rankings, one literally on the bubble, NC State. Number 24, number 25, number 27, number 33. There's a couple more teams inside the top 50. Just absolutely brutal. Very, yeah, very pr- deep region, but UNC is going to kill everybody, right? Yes. I, 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 it's actually probably worse for us as fans that they don't have a second bid because the fight for that second bid 
was going to be something to behold. I mean, you had NC State, South Carolina, UNC Wilmington, UNC Charlotte. You got your dark horses like Duke. You know, like there are a lot of good teams in the region. And uh, it's unfortunate that we won't get that that the drama to play out. I mean, obviously, teams are still going to be playing hard, but all to just fall at the feet of, of dark side. Wow. Brutal. But you know what? You can play the games. This is how the bid allocation works. Everybody knew what they were up against going into Sunday. And NC State loses on Universe to Cal. Crazy. Yeah, not only, not only look, I I I'm not shedding any tears for NC State. They just they simply did not do the work this year. I I I don't know what why this team is not better necessarily, but like you know, th- what what is what have they done that's impressed not much. Hey, I mean, look, they beat Auburn 12-9 in Smoky Mountain Invite. It's ter- <laughs> that's terrible these days. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not trying to beat up on Auburn. Look, they they lost Northeastern. They got Ran out by UMass. Uh, they lost to Cal twice at Easterns. They're, they lost 13-8. Like, I know that 12-11 loss was the last one, and it felt like they could. How about the 13-8 loss they took to Cal? Like, that, Very fair. you know, they, they, they put themselves in, in a tough, tough spot. Meanwhile, out West, UBC and Washington able to uh, close up those Northwest bids likely to be a three bid region for the Northwest with um, Oregon earning uh, comfortably earning the first bid, of of course, excluding BYU. And then uh, UBC and Washington coming in just under the wire right at the bubble. Uh, It didn't really look like there were shenanigans out at Northwest Challenge, Keith. Uh, But, uh, you know, it was enough. Some some big wins for each team was enough to carry them through to bids. Quite quite the opposite, given that Teams are going out there beating UBC and Washington. <laughs> so uh, Western Washington was like, to hell with this bid. I want, I want to try and give you all some drama. We're beating Washington <laughs> again. Uh, so, yeah, if, if teams were, if teams had some sort of mathematical, if they had the calculator out, I, I, I don't think that they would have gone for these, uh, these upsets over UBC and Washington that we did see, uh, even though U, UBC ends up getting the, the win in the end. And, and the region brought home the bids. This is a very de- I think this region is very comparable to the AC. I think it would be a like cross division rivalry matchup where like you know you get the best team playing UNC. Uh maybe they get maybe you get BYU. So you get BYU versus UNC and then you get like UBC versus NC State and Washington versus South Carolina and just down the line Oregon State versus Wilmington like I don't know who's winning that matchup. I think it's, I think it's a pretty deep region itself, and and they'll have three bids to to show for it. Yeah, oh, pretty, I skipped Oregon. I skipped Oregon. It's going to be very interesting because you know, look at this Utah team that goes all the way to the final, and that's after. I mean, I was like at the end of Saturday, I was like, yes, I called it. Utah State with the <laughs> yeah. crossover, they're going to do it, and then they lose in quarters to Utah. <laughs> oh, so close, buddy. So close. But there's there's a lot of good teams up in this region, and. I don't think I, I feel pretty confident that Oregon is going to get one of those bids. But beyond that, I'm not sure that I feel like it's a lock for, you know, UW or UBC. All right. Big, big picture here, right? You look at you look at the bids. We've got the AC with one. We've already talked a bit about that, how that's a surprise. Great Lakes, ME, Southeast with one. I, I don't think anything is is surprising there. What else stands out to you is like. This is a shock from where we thought they were going to be in the year, or this is undeserved. What else stands out to you when you look at the men's division numbers? Well, I think if you know if BYU played conferences, it would feel like for sure Northwest was getting too many bids. Three doesn't feel crazy to me, given the depth. And you know, it feels like it's kind of AC's got to be feeling like, why are we the ones who get one bid and the Northwest gets three when we're like the same region? That's fair. And they're not wrong. It's just that's how it breaks down. Um. Other than that, no, I honestly think this is pretty fair. I mean, I, I feel happy for New England to get four bids because I think they des- they clearly deserved it and they deserved it last year and they kind of got screwed because of the system. And this year, they're going to send a lot of good teams to nationals. I don't think anybody's going to want to play those New England teams at nationals. No, and I, 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 unless unless like uh, somebody sneaks in, but Tufts, Tufts has looked like a, a real squad. So I, I would not want to 
drawing with them necessarily. You know, North Central ends up with two, and that's a little bit tough for them. And Ohio Valley ends up with one. We've seen such a great run for uh, Ohio State. They did not play well at Easterns. The Southwest getting four feels is probably the biggest surprise to me. You know, not uh, we knew that they had that they had good good teams. We knew that like two three felt right, but Santa Cruz is probably still the biggest surprise of the entire season. Maybe UMass, uh, but Santa Cruz has been has been a real surprise. And then you know, another none of the other teams ended up blowing it. If Cal got, Cal got back in position, none of the other big three ended up blowing it. So a Southwest four is 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 a pretty surprising shift for me and and certainly ac1 like those are those are the two numbers that really stand out to me and the thing is uh, though i i can't even complain because ucla went out to smoky mountain and they got the job done you know they beat Pitt, they beat northeastern they beat nc state they beat carlton like they the only they, they lost to minnesota texas and vermont and like okay those teams are just better than them but they like they beat all these other like mid mid top 25 teams they totally earned it same thing with cal you can't complain that they got the bids when they went out and they won the games it's not like they just had some cincinnati type resume where they like beat up on bad teams and like bubble algorithm stuff like worked in their favor no they went and they played hard tournaments they beat teams and they took the bids from those teams that's exactly how it's supposed to work there's part of me that like I've made this argument before. I feel like I'm I'm on an island here. But there's part of me that's like I feel like four should be the cap. If you can't if you can't finish top four in your region, like do I really need you at nationals? Like is nationals really going to be that bad without you? Well, Probably. have we had a five bid region in some time? No, not not in a while. Uh, but they they have existed, but more frequently it's, in the women's it, division. It, to but, be fair, uh, if if BYU played in the women's but, division, the Northwest would get five. Right. But it sounds uh, like they're going to be sitting it out as well. It's a rarity, uh, Charlie. I just, I just want want you to know, for all those haters out there, the best team in the Metro East is ranked above the best team in the Great Lakes. I just want to throw that out there in the men's. For all the haters, is that real? <laughs> Ottawa is ranked number thirty-one according to these rankings. Now uh, they didn't get to ten games, so they're not going to actually count. How far? How far down do you got to go to get to the next Metro East team? Rutgers at sixty-three. Uh, who, for my money, is actually probably the favorite to to win the win the region, but that's that's still pretty pretty generously far for Michigan. I, I don't I wouldn't really take the Metro East over the Great Lakes, but just saying, just saying. Is the Southeast Southeast is still better than both of those regions? I think Georgia Georgia's just a big difference maker. Although it's not like they're like an amazing team. No, but they they have the they have the capability of being a top. You know, a pre-quarters slash quarters team at at nationals. I think. Plus, like as much as we're making fun of Auburn, like I think they have talent. You know, Georgia Tech, we've seen good moments from. Emory even has some good wins. Like, yeah, I I think the Southeast is is a clear step above where the Great Lakes and and Metro East are. So, uh, let's take a look at the women's side now. Not nothing really changed this weekend. Um, Yale ends up dropping. But it doesn't matter because there was no other Metro East team up in the mix. Um, so ultimately, yeah, they, here they, is, I mean, they went to like so they went to a one day like developmental tournament. I, I think right. they knew that it didn't really matter. It didn't matter. Yeah. So uh, here's your bid allocation. AC gets to uh, Great Lakes, ME, North, North Central, OV, Southeast get one. Um, South Central gets two. The New England gets three, the Southwest gets three, and Northwest is going to get five. And I'm sorry, I need to adjust and say that Western. Oh, wait a minute. No, they are going to get five. They're, oh, yeah, they will. Because they're going to gonna get gonna five either way. Wow. So there it is. Now you're saying there should be a cap at four. Northwest is going to get five. But like, do you really think they don't deserve the five? No, I, I, it's not that I, I think they don't deserve the five. It's just like. If if you if you can't finish top like I guess if they're like it, it, I always think it's good to test something with the extremes. Let's say that Washington, UBC, uh, and the Victoria and Oregon, Oregon were literally the four best teams in the country. Okay, and you're Western Washington, and you're the twelfth best team in the country. Okay, like I get why you're like okay, they're the twelfth best team in the country. It's not their fault that they're in a region with the four best teams in the country, they should get to go to nationals. So like, I get the argument, but like 
that's a pretty rare situation. And like the same people that argue that the Metro East shouldn't have a bid at all are like, well, what if what if you're the fifth best team in this in the Central? Um, if you can't make the top five in your region, like how good are you? I don't, you know what I mean? Like, am, am I am I talking crazy? I don't. You're I don't not, think you're I not am. talking crazy because keep in mind, in D three there is a cap of four bids for a region. There's a cap. I don't think it's outlandish to say there should be a cap in D1 as well. Now, here's what would happen had if there were to be a cap. The next bid would drop down to NC State in the Atlantic Coast, which would end up with three bids with, of course, North Carolina number one overall. Then you've got Virginia at 14, NC State at 21, and then Duke and uh, South Carolina also in the top 30. I don't think that would be crazy. But I do think on the whole, it's likely that the fifth team from the Northwest is better than the third team from the AC. I think that's fair to say. I I don't I don't necessarily disagree with that. I just think like the bar being you have to be able to like make semifinals at regionals to to make it to nationals is not outlandish and, you know, maybe better for the general growth of ultimate. I mean, certainly when you look at the women's division right now, it feels a little like haves and haves nots as far as the regions go. Like, how often are we looking at the same? Well, the Great Lakes got one. The Metro East got one. The Southeast got one. North Central. Guess who the best team in North Central is? It's still Carlton. Like, you know, (laughs) how long have we been doing this dance? Uh, I feel like it's on when your region is good. (laughs) It's true, but I think it's on these teams to step up and earn another bid. You don't have to beat Carlton to go to nationals from the North Central. You just have to be good enough to earn a bid. Yeah. I I I I get it, and it's not like it's not like oh, nationals is going to be so bad because they don't have a third AC team or third South Central team or whatever or second North Central team. Like nationals is going to the, the the bottom seeded teams at nationals are not going to define what nationals is like. Uh, but I think we I think we can strike a balance between absolute competitive fairness where. Nationals is literally only the best 20 teams or the best number of teams or whatever, and what might be healthy for the development and growth of the sport nationally. I would argue that we already have that. And I, do, I, th- I think that we mostly have that. Would, what if a region had six bids? What if a region had seven or eight bids? Would you think that that's good? <laughs> that would be a crazy thing. Um, would I think that it's good? The Northwest, the Northwest literally, like, how how far are they from being able to get Another bid, you know what I mean? Like to be six bids, they were they weren't far off. At they were all. not far. Okay, I, I, let's get above that to uh, numbers unseen before. Portland goes D one. They play the <laughs> same schedule. Now they're they're thirty fourth. They, you're they just, get a you're kind of out of team. You're kind of mm-hmm. out of teams. You know, like you run out of teams at some point. Uh, look, you I know, is it I crazy get your to point. think of like Utah getting a bid? You know, like I don't but, think but so. You're talking. We haven't seen a five bid region in a really long time. Maybe. Since maybe in the tide of evil empire Northwest days, we saw this, but I can't remember. We'd have to look back in the history books. But, you know, I don't think it's crazy to have eight of the teams at Nationals be from the West Coast. They've been the best teams. Southwest, Northwest combined going to have eight teams. That's no. Yeah, that, and that's that, that's different than eight teams from one region. I hear you. Uh, and the I, last the last year that we had five, I think, was uh, 2016. Yes. Height, height of the evil empire. My, my only reason to limit. Maybe the cap of you know five or six would be the pr- the challenges of like bubbles in the algorithm, and that causing one region to float too much. But I you know I, I don't think I, I think you're you're trying to you're, you're you're searching for an answer to a problem that doesn't really exist right now. No, I mean I, I, this is more or less a problem with where we are at now, and more a problem with like. Some of the arguments I see made, like, "Oh, how come? How come we still have to give a bid to the Great Lakes or the Metro no, East?" I agree with you there. South, like, we, you, I, we, folks on this show, we do not, we do not tolerate the you know your region doesn't get a bid talk. We we don't do that around here. So this is Metro East you, alumni up in here. Okay, <laughs> I just think everybody when you go into the series, everybody should have a chance to go to nationals, and I, I, I don't think anybody should be deprived of that. It would make the postseason literally feel pointless. And that's not fair to hundreds of players to benefit. This is how we do it. 60 players or whatever. It's the same yeah. way they do it in all college sports. Every conference is going to get a bid. 
There's terrible yeah. conferences that are going to get, they're going to get in as the 16 seed and they're going to get their doors blown off, but you still get to go. If you win your conference, if you win your region, you get to go. That's a great rule. Sorry for the haters out there <laughs> who don't want the Metro East to be at nationals. They're going to hang L's on you this year in the women's division. Metro East used to first. win things. Don't there, there's <laughs> been, we've had our, have our day. Look, we always, we always had two bids in the women's division. That would have been the real shock. I wish that was the story we we're talking about now. Uh, you know, the Northwest with with five is probably the biggest biggest shocker here uh, for me. The South Central getting two though, it's low key a story because uh, I don't, I don't I, they were very much not on their way to that. <laughs> I know UT Dallas was was uh, earning some earning some pub, but Colorado State comes in at Centex and turns their whole season around with big wins over NC over California and Ohio State. Uh, they get a win over UVA. You know, that's like massive win. Yeah, that's like 30% of their ranking right there uh, in those wins. So like what a, what a big difference that made, because I, I think that we were very much on the path to uh, South Central one bid, and that would have put, you know, another bid in the in the AC's hands. Uh, I think and Colorado State's kind of legit. But, I think yeah. Colorado State's kind of legit. Hey, I was on the early season Colorado hype trade uh, or Colorado State hype trade. I was I was there in the beginning and I got shouted down. So uh, <laughs> I feel a little vindicated, although it, it was a windy path to to get to this point. All right, uh, but otherwise, I don't, I don't know that the results are necessarily shocking anywhere. Um, you know, there, there had been some hope for a third third bid for the AC or a second for the North Central or even maybe a fourth for New England. Uh, none of that really came around. So this this actually feels pretty chalky to me. Maybe aside from that, I, I, the Northwest, like the five bit thing is is pretty conceivable when you look at which teams it is. Yeah, I think Uvic is the is the surprise team of that group. But that's where you get into like the there's one to two bids that, that you're like, not really sure where they're going to go. And that's how it played out this year. They went to the South Central and the Northwest. All right. Well, uh, let's quickly take a look at the uh, scoring from our picks this weekend, Keith, and then we will talk a quick uh, look into what's going on in the pro leagues. Are you, are you sure this part isn't going to be lost in the editing room somehow? The part where we have to admit that the subscribers are beating us? No, you can't be serious. <laughs> Charlie, the score right now, is, according to our scoreboard, is subscribers 47, me 44, Charlie 43. That is just horrendous. What happened this weekend? How did this happen? All right, so the the subscribers had uh, UNC winning Easterns. You had that as well, uh, but I had UMass, so they got a point points on me there. And then they had Washington and UBC in the Northwest, uh, so they had they got the UBC points in the final. You know, it's just uh, it's not looking good for us right now. It's not, but you know what? Wisdom of the crowd, Keith. We can at least say we were close. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna bounce. We're gonna back. get back into regionals. We're gonna we're gonna back oh, into yeah. regionals. Big That's, time. This is where the where pick and chalk just won't work for them. I I uh, shout out to the subscribers for picking literally chalk every single week. And <laughs> oh, good for you. You win picking the same top seeds every time. <laughs> no way you're trash talking a conglomerate of subscribers <laughs> right now. <laughs> um. So anyway, uh. But really, congrats. There's going to be some prize packs going out for uh, some some random subscribers. So uh, we'll, we'll look forward to getting into that. And uh, yeah, regionals pick them coming soon. So and, there you uh, go. If anybody if anybody has any ideas for what we should put on the line for regionals against our. Uh, I, I think we may end up betting against the double overtime folks. OK, uh, for for regionals picks. So we need a good bet. So if anybody's got a, got a, got good stakes for that, who what should, what should the losers have to do? What should the winners get if we uh, if we do regional pick them against the double overtime hosts? Hit us up deep look pod on Twitter at uh, deep look at old uh, by email. OK, so the Premier Ultimate League kicked off this weekend. Two games in action. Raleigh taking on Columbus in North Carolina and uh, the Austin Torch hosting the Portland Rising. Raleigh gets the win 14-10 uh, with a very shorthanded roster. And uh, Portland Rising travels well, gets the 14-13 win over the torch. That's going to be a big W as they try to make a push in the very, very, very talented East Division. So, um, Keith, what do you think overall? 
that that's that's obviously the biggest result. It counts it counts in the standings. Uh, it's definitely a, a notable result. But was it was the most interesting mm. interesting result one that didn't count? Mm. Philadelphia surge take the ten nine universe point loss to uh, to UNC in a scrimmage. UNC breaking to win. Crazy. Uh, it's it's been a fun topic of conversation how they how they would do in in the PUL. Let's but, let's let's discuss it right here. Does okay. UNC go to championship weekend as a PUL team? Assuming that they clone all of their common players with the uh, Radiance. So they so they do have to they have to play the Radiance. They have to beat the Radiance in the South. I think I think so. Or or get in as the wild card. I don't think they're getting in as, as the wild card. I get I get the argument though if they just beat Search. Uh I, I don't know if I buy that though. Um I think do I think they beat Radiance really is the question. With clones, I don't think so. I, I I don't think so. If they get to keep the UNC players and the Radiance lose them, are they the best team in the South? Yeah. Yeah, they are. So in that case, yes. But clones, I think I probably take Radiance. Pretty impressive though to see uh UNC. I mean, that, that's just how good they are. I, I think, you know. There's caveats here. Surge playing their first time together as a team. UNC has been practicing together. Many of their core players have been playing together for like three or four years at this point. Um, and they're the kind of the getting towards where they're going to be peaking in their college season. But regardless, to go up against elite club players and come out with a win, it's very impressive. Speaks highly of the triangle. As if nobody's done that before. <laughs> <laughs> so uh the surge will take the field for their first a- live action game during the actual pul season this coming weekend they're going to face the gridlock and that's going to be an awesome one that one is on saturday april 8th the washington dc shadow will take on indy red in dc also on saturday so that's what's rematch going on uh, from, uh, from championship weekend right that's right that's right um, and in the uh, Western Ultimate League, things are uh, moving along. Arizona, after their strong start, they've dropped a couple of games. They're now sitting at two and two. They're third in the uh, third out of four in the Southwest Conference at this point. Seattle looking good, and uh, you know Oregon gets on the board with their first win as as this weekend. The Alpen Glo- Alpen Glow go on the road to Seattle and Oregon and just get crushed. Uh, they lose twenty eight sixteen. To Seattle and 2013 to Oregon. Tough, tough travel schedule, uh, but also your first road trip really as a team. It's a tough one. I'm sure they're looking forward to playing in the thin air and the friendly confines at home in front of a home crowd. I, I think they'll probably be very energized going to their next match uh, uh, against Utah. That's a big one. So uh, Arizona's hosting San Diego this coming weekend as well. Hosting. So- okay. Yeah. Okay. I know. You know, you know Arizona, Arizona at gets home. a lot scarier. At Arizona home. at home. <laughs> Danger. Uh, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Arizona, uh, after the uh, dream start, kind of scuffling a little bit as it seems like the top teams are starting to find their form. Over in the AUDL, Keith, uh, rosters have mostly been released across the league. And, uh, you know, look, it's no surprise. New York and DC look like the top two teams in the league. Uh, the Empire basically bring back all of their key players. And I think what's going to maybe be a little underrated, Keith, they, they, the bottom, like, you know, five, six, seven guys on their roster are definitely better than last year. And so they're just simply better than they were a year ago. It's kind of hard to believe. I, I still feel like people are writing off uh, the flyers, right? They, they get, they pick up Joe white. It's LSB true. is back. He's back. Like that, those are those are huge pickups. Like, are those better? Are they better than any individual player that DC picked up? I don't know. Beef's pretty good, but as individual players, maybe so. But I think yeah, DC it, on the whole probably got sure. DC on the whole got better pickups. But I'm just saying, you're bringing in star power. We know they're going to have depth. I, I think people are riding off Raleigh a little too early because they were not quite the juggernaut they've been in the past last year. But I, th- I think they may be proving a little something. I, I, I'm not going to favor them over DC or or New York right now. But people are acting like it's a two horse race, and I still think I still think Raleigh's in the mix. I mean, Raleigh's clearly going to championship weekend. Indy's winning the central. 
You calling Indy? Our, our, our prediction show is going to be fun. It's going to be fun. We're, what's coming soon? Uh, so more to come on the AUDL as we get closer to opening day in about three weeks. All right, that is going to do it for this week's edition of Deep Look. Before we go, one other, one last thing I almost forgot. The North American Youth Ultimate Championships, which was designed to be a uh, an alternative to YCC and more or less trying to compete with YCC for teams, has called it quits for this year, Keith. They were going to... Mm-hmm come out and and have this big you know they come out with a bunch of teams already signed up but some of those teams also applied for ycc bids got those ycc bids and then people wanted to go to yccs so that uh spelled doom for the n-a-y-u-c what do you make of this it's tough i mean we, we talked a bit about the implications of just having this second tournament pop up and we we've certainly talked a lot about USA Ultimate's relationship with the big state-based organizations, but there's nothing you can do if you can't generate the interest. And it, getting off the ground is like kind of the hardest part. Like getting people to view to view something as an alternative to YCCs as as being as good or, or close to as good as as what the kids already think about YCCs. It's just so easy to be like, well, I know what YCC is. I know how much it means. It means something to everybody else. I don't have to like wonder if people are going to think it's legit. I could just go to YCCs. Like that's what I want to do. Getting people out of those habits is is always going to be hard, and getting the support is difficult without the centralization that you get from USA Ultimate. You know, so it's. I think it's a little bit sad that it couldn't come together, just because I think it would have been nice to see some potential change in this space. But maybe there's enough talk that it, we will see it, but. I, I still feel like I, I don't think this is going to ease tensions in what's become a, a rather fracturous relationship. They got to figure out a better way to do YCCs than telling a bunch of teams they can't come for reasons that may or may not have to do with anything that has to do with their on field performance, which mostly doesn't. And, you know, tying basically paying USA Ultimate money into whether you get to go to YCC doesn't seem fair. There's 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 massive amounts of work to be done on this and like people need to become friends again. We need we need to have our organizations working together, not not fighting with each other and having like Cold War tournaments like this. So, um, yeah, it's uh, interesting. More probably more to come on this. We'll we will discuss further in the future. That's going to do it for the show. Uh, join us for our subscriber bonus segment. We got a bunch more mail to get to, so we're going to answer your questions in the subs only bonus segment out the back. We'll talk to you there. Till next week, he's Keith, I'm Charlie. Talk to you soon.